Marcus Loth is a British journalist with a love for anything interesting from UFOs, aliens, and the ancient astronaut theory to the paranormal, general conspiracies, and un unsolved mysteries. He also has a passion for film, music, and the NFL. That's National Football League for anybody who doesn't know. Marcus has been editor-in-chief at UFO Insight. Uh, for several years. He also runs and writes his own website, Me Time for the Mind, that's metimeforthemind.com, and writes for other media platforms, most predominantly Listverse. Marcus regularly appears on radio talk shows discussing these fascinating topics. So, Marcus Loth, welcome to Behind the Paranormal. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's good to talk to you. Thank you very much. No, oh, it's great to have you with us. So let's uh, hop right into our, our subject for today, which is organ recipients who take on some characteristics of their donors. So Marcus, does this phenomenon have a name, and can you sort of give us an overview of it? Yeah, I mean, it's not so common to cellular memory. Uh, some people call it cell memory theory. Um, <clears throat> and it's basically the idea is that Organ uh, recipients, you know, trying to receive um, organs from, from donors, um, take on in part the memories of those donors, uh, sometimes the personality traits of, <clears throat> excuse me, of those donors also. It doesn't happen across the board, although when we look at some of those, uh, some of the reasons, you know, some of the um, information from the people who say that they don't experience any of this phenomenon is quite interesting because normally they will also exhibit sort of um, traits of denial. So um, it, it's actually interesting to see how much this actually does occur. But essentially, that's what it is. It's cellular memory, and it's to do with uh, recipients of donors, recipients of organs taking on the personality uh, of their donors. You know, just to and Don, that interrupt, Ben, it's your line of questioning, but uh, Marcus, just this morning, you, you very kindly sent a link uh, to the UFO Insight uh, online magazine with an, a new article, for, uh, yeah. uh, hot off the presses, as we w used to say, <laughs> uh, links between cellular memory and organ transplants, a case study. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. When your next question, Ben, is about some cases, I mean, maybe we could blend the two questions. Yeah, sure. You know, why <laughs> Why not? Um, and let's, let's see what we get. So I guess why don't you give us a couple, couple cases and maybe match it up with the article you sent over. Okay, well, I mean, probably the best one to start with is, is quite a well-known one. It's uh, to do with a, a young lady called Amy Tibbins, a uh, 17-year-old who received um, the heart of, um, she didn't know at the time, but she received the heart of a um, law enforcement officer. Um, she was a typical teenager, um, you know, indifferent to most things, if you like. Um, but upon receiving this new heart, apart from the normal um, lease of life that she would have felt, she had this sense of um, wanting to look after her community. Uh, she also had um, strong urges to do DIY and, and, and home hardware projects. When she looks into who her donor was, this all kind of made sense to her because he obviously was a law enforcement officer, so he had that sense of to protect and to serve. And he too was uh, an intense um, DIY person. Um, and, and most of these cases kind of uh, revolve around a, a similar thing. Uh, if you just uh, flip through my notes here, uh, another one, for example, in the UK is a lady called Cheryl Johnson. Now, she had two kidney transplants. Um, with each of those transplants, she took on a different personality. The first one um, made her really quite... Um, short-tempered, which was completely different to her normal personality. When that kidney failed and it was removed from her body and she was given another kidney, uh, another personality, again, uh, took over, if you like. So, um, yeah, I mean, th th there's numerous, numerous cases. Well, what is worth probably pointing out that while you do get this with kidney and, and liver transplants, it's most predominantly with heart transplants. And although we don't know why, researchers seem to think that the cells in the brain, which store memory, or which we believe stores memory, are also present or seem to be present in the heart. Um, and that'll probably go against accepted thinking that the brain is the only place in the body that stores memory. Um, as I say, that's why there's uh, something there to research, really. But I mean, yeah, there's, there's numerous other cases that they tend to revolve around, around um that type of thing, you know, as soon as you you, you receive this organ, this this, uh, this new piece of uh, equipment, if you like, in your body, it, it can sometimes result in a completely new personality, or in part at least. So here's a question: Is it? Mm -hmm. I'm trying. I'm trying to think of how to how to how to put it. Um, so it, it seems like most of these changes are are some of them are relatively subtle, and most are drastic. Is there any sort of determining factor for how drastic or subtle the personality change would be? 
I would say, well, there's probably two things to say here. Um, going back to, the, to what the organ is, with such transplants as kidneys and liver transplants, it tends to be um, trivial things, if you like. Maybe you might um, have a new desire to try some new food that you've never liked before. Um, with heart transplants, and I would say especially where... If we think of like ghost manifestation, for example, people tend to say, or one theory on that is that um, manifestations of ghosts is that leftover energy, particularly say if there's been a murder and it's really intense energy. A good example here is a case of a, a, a chap called Carl, who was um, a police officer who was shot in the face, basically. Um, he's, his heart went to a chap called Ben. After that transplant, he started experiencing intense dreams of flashes of light in his face, which was obviously when he chased, you know, tracked through his his, uh, his donor, discovered what had happened to him. It was obviously the last memory of the last vision that uh, his donor saw. So I would say it's, it was it will go back. It, it's probably to do with whether it's a heart or whether it's a lesser organ, if you like. And arguably, there's no proof, but arguably the circumstances in which the person died. And I would say if it's a particularly violent death or, um, you know, a traumatic death, then I, it, chances are that will reflect in the organ that is transferred over to the, uh, to the recipient. So it makes no difference uh, whether the, the donor has translated or died. So in, in the sense of inheriting personality traits, or, or does it depend on the person as well? The recipient. Um, there's an interesting question about the recipient because when when these have been studied by by uh, you know like Dr. Dr. Purcell for example is is one doctor who's really studied this phenomenon. He tended to he he noted that people who were quite creative, environmentally aware, had a love of the arts, those sort of people tended to to voice um, concerns that they had a new personality once it had an organ uh, transplant. Uh, so it could be to do with the recipient. The idea of whether it's a, an organ, for example, if somebody donates a kidney, um, to, best of, to the best of my knowledge, I have not heard of, of, of um, cellular, mem cellular, cellular memory excuse me, being passed on that way. So it would seem to be that it's, um, it's whether a person has died and that energy is then transferred. I could be wrong on that. It's a good question. It's not something I've come across before, though, in this. Yeah, there really is no way to, to nail down uh, specific... Uh... Uh, certainty on these things. Uh, however, th this does get into some fascinating questions, and we, we exchanged a few words about this yesterday, uh, the yeah. notion of non-locality. And for those who don't know what that is, uh, in, in physics, particularly theoretical physics today, there's, uh, there is a, a study of the physics of consciousness and uh, the notion that uh, our memories and things of this kind are not necessarily within us. And Ben and I are always uh, harping about the uh, island theory that, that uh, you know, in order to in embrace the classical notion of ghosts or anything else, you have to believe the island theory that, that within everything we are is within our bodies. And um, there is actually very little evidence for that, the circumstantial as it may be. Uh, perhaps the, the notion of non-locality gets into, as, as we said yesterday, Marcus, gets into the idea of um, you know, Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. Uh, it seems that the cellular, cellular memory, if that's what it is in these cases, puts a very interesting twist on that. Can you comment? Yeah, I mean, because... It it's interesting because part of the article that we, we put out on UFO Insights today looks at some of the esoteric leanings and even connections to the occult. Um, now, again, you know, by definition, these sort of things are, um, you know, far from being able to be proven. But we would talk about, like, the reality is our consciousness that's within us or whether it's a, like a universal cosmic consciousness. There's a theory of thought that really it's kind of both of those things. And, for example... If we look at people who who can uh, you know leave their bodies at will, have out of body experiences and, and things of that nature, um, there's you're almost separating one part of your body from the other, uh, and the part of the body that goes, you know, off onto uh, its astral projection, um, that's the part of the body that can take in this conscious um, these conscious memories. Um, for example, like the Akashic Record, which is meant to be like a memory of everything that's ever happened. Um, and, uh, you know, if you were mentioning Jung's collective unconscious, that's essentially what he's, he's kind of, in my opinion, is what he's kind of leaning towards, uh, like a knowledge bank of all living things. Uh, and that just that includes not just human beings. I mean, there's, there's theories that include animals and any sentient being in that. So 
it's like anything else in, 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 in the paranormal, whether it's UFOs and ghosts or, or, or this, there's a big rabbit hole that you start down. And once you start down it, you kind of branch off into so many different arees that, you know, um, it, it can take you, it can just take you places you don't even realise that you were going to end up. So, yeah, I mean, um, I think it does put a twist on it. I think it does make us really start to question what, what, what death is, what consciousness is, what life is. Yeah. Well, perhaps uh, we can introduce another tributary to the rabbit hole. Uh, as I don't know if you're familiar with our work, but we get yeah. a great deal into the non-locality thing by way of, of uh, multiverse awareness, as we call it. And right. in our opinion, uh, that there is evidence in our work anyway that uh, someone like the young girl uh, who received the uh, law enforcement officer's heart mm -hmm. um, already is the law enforcement officer in another part of the multiverse, okay? There is a yeah. sort of a, a very concrete unity. And we're also very physical. Um, in, in the earliest cases uh, that I encountered in the early 1970s, there was very little evidence that we were dealing with spirits. I'm talking about ghost cases. And things like that. They seem to be going about their daily lives in uh, parallel realities. And it took a while to, to come to that uh, opinion. But um, and again, it could be wrong, but I think that's one possibility. So perhaps there is a factor of multiverse awareness when I receive a transplanted liver from uh, – I don't know, the governor of Rhode Island, or, you know, I mean, I mean, who knows? I mean, it, um, you know, it, it, did the young lady go out and start arresting people? I mean, I, I you know, but it didn't seem to be to the, to be to that degree, but nevertheless, maybe this is something that ought to be looked at uh, at some point that that's just, um, you know, our, our two cents on that. But can you yeah. give us uh, some more, or, or you can comment on that, or if you want to... Well, no, I mean, I, I was probably going to lead into another example, which I think he was going to ask, I think he was going to ask anyway, but I mean, yes. yeah, well, comment basically, I mean, yeah, I think um, you mentioned about the the young girl who, who you know, she didn't go around and start arresting people, and what was, was she already, uh, the, uh, the, the, the officer's personality? And um, a good example here would be the one, um, just let me pull this up while I'm speaking to you, it was... A donor who was 18, whose heart ended up going to uh, a young girl, a young girl called Danny, he'd never met before. Now, when his parents, um, when his parents actually found letters in his cupboard, he'd, he'd almost predicted his own death. And he'd not only predicted his own death, he predicted that he would give uh, his heart to somebody called Danny. Uh, he didn't, didn't mention whether it was a girl or a boy, it was a girl. Um, and even down to the age and, and, and how he would die, it's really quite you know, ominous and chilling stuff. When his parents got in touch with this um, young girl who received his heart, she had she had the stern belief that, you know, that her donor was from a past life, basically, that they were lovers in past lives and he'd kind of come into this realm or this existence to save her life here. And, and I think it kind of ties in a little bit to what you're saying, that, you know, Everything is everything, and just on, we, we mentioned this in one of articles about time. Uh, and again, it's a, people think of time as linear, and we kind of argue that it's not so much linear. It's it's more of a of a circle, and everything is happening at once all the time. Yes, uh, and that's kind of hard to get your head around unless you've kind of already kind of got your head around it to begin with. I'm sure you you know what I'm saying. Oh, exactly. It is difficult to get one's head around, as as is the idea of a sort of identity uh, within. The biosphere, you know, um, yeah. and one, I've talked to indigenous uh, people, um, shamans, who would say that uh, it embraces um, not just the biosphere, but, or actually the, the biosphere embraces everything, it, even things we consider to be inanimate objects. And they'll say, well, there really mm -hmm. is no such thing. So th this is a, a very large scope we're, we're dealing with here. Um, mm -hmm. do, do, uh, does the age of the donor or recipient uh, in, in your work, has that uh, made any difference in how much of the personality is is uh, absorbed uh, by cellular, mem cellular memory or whatever? Um, what, what's your observation on that? Well, I mean, you know, I, I've kind of really followed uh, Paul Purcell's work, although I have followed other people's work on this. Um, so what I, from what I can gather, the age is not a factor at all. Uh, I think uh, the, the only real factor as far as the recipient's concerned is, is I guess, whether, whether, how open-minded they may be. For example, Paul Purcell discovered that of, 
of, I think it was 70 odd people that he studied who had had heart transplants, only 20% said that they felt any kind of change whatsoever. Uh, and of those, only 6% thought it was down to the actual transplant itself, you know, to actually um, the, the donor, the donor's personalities. What's interesting, though, is that the other 80% who basically said, well, no, there's, we, there's no change whatsoever in us. They also exhibited traits of denial, uh, traits of wanting to change the subject very quickly, um, and so on. So so I, I think I don't think age is a factor. I think it probably affects more people than we, than we really know. And I think that's like anything else, whether it's UFOs or ghosts or anything else, people don't really want to talk about what they don't understand, what, what scares them. Yeah. Uh, and I want to shut that down. So... Although we we have to say, even even you know, it actually only affects X amount. It probably affects more than more than it probably affects most people who undergo this uh, procedure. Well, all right, let's let's turn it around a bit, Marcus. Uh, mm-hmm. To the to the best of our knowledge, yeah. how many people who receive um, major organ transplants uh, do not? Uh, reflect any personality trait changes? Well, I would say if we look at Paul Purcell's work, I would say that you, you would argue that around 80% don't. I mean, I think there's something between 3,000 to 4,000 um, of these type of operations every year. Um, so, you know, you're talking hundreds, if that, that, that may say, or less than 100 that may say, you know, we definitely do feel like something has changed within us. But what, what I think the key thing is that there's no change. Uh, as I say, just just looking, just going on the traits that they also exhibited, it, it would suggest that there's really a case of denial going on there, and and that they really are kind of experiencing something um, that they, you know, that they just are not sure about, and so they kind of shut it down. Um, it, it because it's so fringe as well, it's hard to even get any type of, of uh, accurate statistics on these type of things. Um, you know, the mainstream scientists are looking at this type of thing more than they probably would do. Mm. Um, but, you know, for wanting to keep funding, for not wanting to be ostracised by your own community, people can tend to keep this a, a, a long distance, you know. And so I think it's hard to get any kind of accurate data. Um, so... Yeah, I, I, that's what I would say on that. Okay. There was what I, I've once or twice run into cases like this and I found them very fascinating. There was one uh, young man in, in Boston, uh, this goes back some years, and he mm-hmm. had received um, a, a, I believe it was a, a liver transplant from mm-hmm. a young woman <clears throat> who, had, who had not survived a, an accident, an automobile accident. And he not only became very close with her family because she saved his life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's very understandable. I and mean, then naturally you feel a bond with someone who saved your life or, and, and oh, their relatives. Yeah. But she also, uh, he also um, had a, 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 not only an aversion, but an allergy to shellfish. And of course here in new England, we eat lots of shellfish and particularly yeah. lobsters. And they, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, however, um, I just found that very interesting because because she had the the donor had had a wonderful love for shellfish and things mm. of this kind, but I found it intriguing that that not only did he pick up a taste for shellfish, his allergy to it disappeared. Have you seen the uh, physical changes of that kind as well as changes in awareness? Yeah, I mean that is interesting. I mean, in in one sense, it kind of backs up what I was saying. In you know, way uh, uh, le- if you like lesser organs, this is a liver. It's not a lesser organ, but you understand what I'm saying. A liver sure. or a kidney transplant, uh, and they tend to trigger, if you like, changes in food, uh, which would be the donor's uh, you know preference in food as well. And heart transplants would be would be a bit more. But what's interesting there in that case that you've just been speaking about is, like you say, it, it's almost like a like a physical change. The guy's gone from being allergic, uh, which you know, those allergies are potentially fatal, to obviously you know being cured for want of a better word. So yeah, that is interesting, and and that kind of makes you then wonder, you know, are we talking about cellular, literally just memories? You know, which people, someone can access. Are we are we talking about something that's which is a bit more active, which you can then fuse? You know, obviously subconsciously, but in within your own body, which obviously causes that example right there of the gentleman 
no longer being allergic. Uh, yes, that's an interesting, and again, the only more study um, with, with sufficient funding or, or kind of really uncover these things. And like I said, because of the myop, my, my myopic nature of, of many mainstream sciences, that, that that's a battle in itself. So, but that, that's an interesting case. I, I'm, not, I'm not aware, I wasn't aware of that one. Yeah. Uh, well, again, many of these things uh, are not being studied. As you say, if people don't report these things, it's the same yeah. thing with, with UFOs or any other or any paranormal activity. If they don't report them, yeah. then how are we supposed to know about them? And that's what we run up against all the time. Um, one of the um, the issues, too, that, that came up in that particular case was that uh, the uh, the family of the young man who received the liver yeah. – um, became very alarmed at changes they saw in him. Now, that's the only time I ever ran into that, having dealt with very few of these cases anyway. Mm-hmm. What, what are the social and family implications that you've observed uh, or that, that people you've studied have observed uh, in, in, in recipients who do have changes? I mean, are there any times when they're very bad changes or alarming or, yeah. or families are concerned? I think there are certainly, from what I can gather, I would say um, more often than not, they are quite ominous and chilling and a bit, you know, disturbing. But there, there are some which are almost bittersweet, if you like, particularly, with, with, I would say, with children. Um, there's a couple of cases um, where, for example, um, we've got the Jerry, the Jerry and Carter case. Now, what this was about was a 16-month-old boy who drowned in a bathtub at home. Now, his heart was given, you know, he, this was Jerry, his heart was given to a young boy called Carter. Now, Jerry's parents met Carter and met Carter's parents, and then Jerry's parents were saying that they could see their son in Carter, uh, how he smiled, even though it was another boy, whether it's placebos of the mind here or not, but they could see there's some smile. But and so that obviously gave them some comfort. But at the same time, they've obviously got the loss that their son is physically no longer with them. And I think, I think you know, like you say, when you've got recipients that um, feel a closeness or a bond to the donor's family, that that's perfectly understandable. I would say also, like you say, we're the other way around, where people are picking up traits that are completely alien to them or to their family. And while obviously they're very grateful, you would imagine, that they are still around, it, yeah, that must be quite unnerving. There was a case, for example, of a um, 47-year-old man who, who took the heart of a teenage girl. who had, She was a gymnast, I believe, and she, she had an accident and unfortunately she died. Um, now, he started seeing the world literally like, through the eyes of a teenager, um, not just to a new lease of life, but he was fascinated with things that adults, you know, would really just find trivial. Uh, he'd giggle at things, really silly things. But on on the ominous side of that, he also took on um, what was essentially like an eating disorder. He would feel intense hunger all of a sudden, uh, stuff his face, basically, and then have this notion in the back of his mind, which I couldn't explain, but w- which was telling him, if you throw up, it'll make you feel better. And his family would then seeing this obviously seeing him lose weight so yeah i mean it's a minefield and i think because it's so understudied and because people don't necessarily want to report it for fear of being ridiculed or or or, you know considered crazy or any manner of things um there's not that much information out there so yeah i mean um it it must be quite an unsettling time uh for the recipient's families as well as the recipients really exactly well, we're coming up on our break, but uh, <laughs> over the break, uh, I'd like to <clears throat> excuse me, uh, have you think about, Marcus, um, mm-hmm. a little bit. I'd like to hear him a little bit more in depth about how cellular memory might work, okay, okay. the mechanics of it, that sort of thing, the process. Okay. Very good. But in the meantime, uh, we're, you're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WON, 1240 AM and 99.3 FM in New England's beautiful Blackstone River Valley. We'll be right back with our fascinating guest, Marcus Loth. Stick with us. Hi, this is Don Brunell inviting you to join us on the Midday Show from noon to 2 every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday with the Super Quiz, great oldies, and interesting guests. That's Midday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday from noon to 2. We've been talking about Internet-targeted advertising. Now, let's talk about TV. The television industry is more competitive than ever, with media companies like Netflix and Hulu disrupting viewership patterns and causing the big networks to rethink their marketing strategies for the new fall TV lineup. So, what drastic measures did ABC, CBS, and Fox do to drive viewership? They invested heavily in radio. 
You got it. Television is turning to radio to promote their products. The last week of September, ABC, CBS, and Fox were three of the eight biggest spenders on radio. Really, it shouldn't come as a surprise, as radio reaches 93% of the U.S. population on a weekly basis. Let's put the power of radio to work for you. Even television owners know, with radio, you don't have to see our ads to get results. Owen Radio. And welcome back to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WOON 1240 AM and 99.3 FM in the Blackstone Valley here of New England here. And we're, we're having a fascinating show today with Marcus Loth, British science journalist, on the subject of people inherit, organ recipients inheriting some of the traits of the donors of the organs. So we, we were thinking of a number of causes. And of course, Marcus has uh, just written an excellent article on cellular memory. Now, can you explain a little bit about how cellular memory might work, Marcus? What is the process there, do you think? Okay, now this is obviously um, speculation. Not everybody accepts this. In fact, some people say that it's, a, you know, it's, it's just complete, uh, it should be debunked. What the idea of cellular memory is, is that of all the millions of cells that are in our body, each one of them not only contains the DNA, our complete makeup of our bodies, but it also contains every single one of our memories, right back through to childhood. Now, just as an offshoot, we were talking about, um, you know, um, the collective unconscious. It could also include all of those memories as well. We don't know. But for the sake of this conversation, it, it includes everything to do with us, every one of those cells. Now, those cells are also present, obviously, in our major organs. And so when these are transferred over to, from out of our body into another body, particularly when we bear in mind that, Essentially, a person has to be kept alive artificially uh, so the, these organs remain fit for transfer. When that transfer is complete, those cells... Then the next person uh, that, that has received the organ. Now, obviously, nobody knows exactly why, and some people say it's not the case. Some people say, you know, that there's a whole manner of other alternative explanations, but, but none of which really hold water, certainly not with the claims that... Um, that have come from people who have experienced this. Um, but once that transfer is complete, those memories are then available and they can then uh, result in personality changes like, like we were discussing in the first half of the show. Um, and, and that's essentially what people think is happening is it's the cells that contain these memories, like, like little brains, basically. Um, as I say, people used to think that the brain was the only part of the body that, that, that stored memories. And... More and more, it seems that that just isn't the case. Uh, and if that is the case, um, then obviously that need, we need to rethink, so not rethink organ donation, but rethink how we do it, and more specifically, the, the, the consequences of organ donation, or organ trans, uh, uh, transplantation, should I say. Okay. What, is there a difference then between cellular memory and ancestral memory, as it's called? <laughs> this is a good one, because... Again, in the opening to the article that we put out today, we, we, we kind of asked that question. You know, there's a theory, like you say, that, for example, I remember everything in my mind, in my being, that my mother, her mother, you know, my great grand, and all the way back down, I remember all of that because it's within my genetic DNA, uh, as, as, will, as will be the case with my son and his son and so on and so forth, or daughter or whatever. Um, it's an interesting one because you would think... You would think not, in the sense that because you're taking the de you're taking those memories from another person, the only way to say that there's a connection, I would say, between uh, cellular memory and, and you know and, and memories from 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 our ancestors, is to say that yes, there is a collective unconsciousness, and uh, you know we need to find what the connection is there. Um, it's an interesting question, though, because the, the idea that we can remember everything that's ever happened uh, through our, anything that we've got genetic connection to, um, it's a great theory. It, it's a really interesting theory. Well, uh, Ben's mom and I were sitting around uh, watching the uh, uh, love story on the Hallmark Channel last night, <laughs> and we, she, she pronounced that we were talking about you, and she said, it's ancestral memory. That explains everything. Uh, right, okay. Yeah, she she's half Russian, so she uh, is rather sure of some of her uh, oh, yes. uh, pronouncements. No, I, um, but anyway, uh, I, I, whether that's true, as, as you say, uh, no one really knows. The notion of um, false memories comes up because of the only other case that I was aware of, and th this was from uh, Massachusetts a number of years ago, and it was mm -hmm. simply a kidney transplant. 
Okay. Right. And um, the the person who was the recipient had uh, memory, and and the, the donor survived. That was relative, as a matter of fact, okay. which may or may not have any relevance. But the uh, the recipient had new memories, uh, essentially that did not come from the donor. In other words, it was it was like the donor had experienced it, but the donor said, "Well, I, I don't remember that, or that never happened." I mean. Uh, rather, another odd twist on this. Have you ever run into anything like that? And what do you think would, would explain it? No, I mean, no, not specific, but um, it's interesting, though, because one of the skeptical views, if you like, uh, you know, other alternative reasons for, for what people are experiencing is this subconscious taking of information. For example, you know, if somebody's laid out recovering from an operation for a transplant, even though they're uh, unconscious or for want of a better phrase, out of it, you know, from the operation, they're still hearing and taking in what's going around them. I mean, people, some people believe you can learn in your sleep, for example, and subliminal learning and that kind of thing, that kind of thing. And so those memories, it's possible that they could have been, you know, if there's been conversations happening around them, they could have been taken in that way. Um, but the fact that what we're saying there is if you're saying, you know, the, the donor's saying, well, they're not my memories, I have no knowledge of that, then I suppose we've got two things or three things we could say is responsible there. One, what we've just discussed is somebody's taken in some subliminal information and wrongly connected it with the transplant. Two, we go back to the idea of collective consciousness again, where basically there's, there are memories and, uh, you know, information and stuff just all around us that we can access, whether we realise we're doing that or not. Or, or three, quite simply, the donor has forgot, and um, those memories are their m- memories. Um, any one of those things could be uh, could be the case. Again, it's an in- the, the more the more things you start to throw up, and the more examples and cases and little twists, is it really is just more reason that we, we need to keep studying this. So they're not just this one particular thing. Right across the board, there's so much we don't know, um, and we just need to keep digging away at it, really. Interesting. So something popped into my mind um, a little, a little, a few questions back, mm-hmm. and it's sort of the the the, the fallout uh, or the the lot the lives of these people who are affected, you know, going forward. So what do, what do they do? Do they do they seek seek treatment? Go go to therapy? Anything like that? I would say it depends on the individual. I mean, um, like anything else, I, you know, I think some people, once they've met the, the donor and the donor's family, they're kind of more at peace. Uh, I would imagine if, you, if you've taken the organ of somebody who's had a traumatic end, I would imagine that that is, um, you know, that, itself, that in itself is going to be uh, something that you would have to deal with. But there's no rule of thumb or set, set way around it, but it tends to be, from what I can gather, upon meeting the donor's family, there tends to be some kind of almost closure at that stage. Um, little things maybe that, you know, for example, the, the guy who couldn't understand why he wanted to throw up all the time. When he met the girl's family and, you know, ping, that's why. There's kind of a reason there and he puts closure on it. But again, I think it'll be different for everybody. Uh, I suppose it depends on exactly what you're, what you're experiencing, what feelings you, you, you're going through at the time, really. Have you ever run into examples of what might be called death memories? Uh, w- one of the issues with ancestral memory that, that we run into is that sometimes people remember their own deaths. And uh, reincarnation, we have a problem with that because of Einstein's uh, 1952 theory that because the time really doesn't exist that way. There is no past. Uh, mm-hmm. Simultaneity, as we were speaking of before. All these are yeah. issues. But have you run into people uh, who have had or cases in which people have had memories of things that 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 happened, um, you know, either immediately before the uh, transplant or th- that had were well, years after the transplant. I mean, this sort of thing, uh, death well, memories. When you say death, I mean, do you mean that they have memories of their own death still to come, like in the future, or a death that's happened in the past, like a past could life? be. Well, one of the problems, uh, one of the creepier things about dying, I, I guess, is that the brain, in most cases, unless you're hit by a, a, a goods train or something, is that <laughs> you, um, it, it remains conscious in many cases for uh, a while, and you could hear yeah. yourself being pronounced dead. I mean, that's rather yeah. creepy there. But, uh, you know, but assuming that that's not the case, or, or even that it is, I mean, why would people, people certainly would not have ancestral memories of of anything after they they were born and were you know separated from the body of the parents say or the ancestor whatever but um 
we do run into, and this has nothing to do with transplants, but we do run into people who have memories of, of dying uh, or someone else's death, rather vivid in many cases. I mean, have you ever run into that? Uh, th th is it might be related to transplants? Well, I, say, I mean, I've run into that in terms of when we've, when we've looked at reincarnation and things of that nature. Um, in terms of transplants, the, the closest thing that I would say would be the 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 chat that we spoke about earlier who who predicted his death, you know, who knew he was going to die and knew his heart would go to somebody called Danny. Um, it, it's a, Again, it is interesting, though, the concept of reincarnation and, and whether, you know, does one thing make something else impossible? I mean, like we, we spoke, for example, about time being not linear and being spherical and happening all the time. Um, for example, people believe, some people believe we're just a manifestation of energy and we'll go on to another manifestation after this human manifestation. Um, so all of these things could could be possible. And I know that's an ambiguous answer uh, and really doesn't nail anything. But I think if someone was to sit here and say, well, you know, this is what's, this is it and this is it and this is it, I'd be very suspicious of them. I would um, too. Yeah, I, I, I just think, I think there's so much, um, so much to understand and there's, I think, as you say, I mean, I, I, came, I came into this sort of, uh, you know, researching the paranormal and such as a UFO writer, and you just find yourself going down so many avenues that you end up speaking about organ donation and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it, are all these things connected? They could be. Some people do think you can connect all of these things. Now, I don't know whether you, it's going to be that simple, but I think there's certainly a lot of bleed into other areas uh, that are apparently unconnected. Um that's probably part of the mystery. That's probably part of the the fun, for one of the I think so. word. Yes. Now uh, we're we're burning up the hour pretty quickly here, Marcus. Uh, <laughs> let's take a moment. Now. Tell us, please, about your website, where people can find out more. And uh, I must say, I really enjoy your writing, and that's how we discovered you, actually. So, thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Um, you can you can always see us on UFO Insight for a start. We release um, you know regular articles on there. That's going to grow and grow and grow. As the name suggests, that's obviously more around UFO uh, phenomena. But we look at conspiracy. We look at paranormal, supernatural. Uh, I run Me Time for the Mind. Um, that's not as regular in terms of new content, but hopefully that will change in the near future. Uh, it's a similar content to UFO Insight, but we look at things like mysteries from antiquity, uh, things from prehistory, you know, is Atlantis real? Uh, were there ancient civilizations, for example, long before we even think civilization first began? Uh, so there's, there's so much. It's such an interesting world. There's so much to look at. And you can, you know, see my take on them at UFO Insight and me time for the mind com basically. So, Very yeah, good. Check and, us out uh, there. Once we manage to get our website back up, uh, we will have a Talking Points page for this show, and we'll have a link uh, to Marcus's site and also to the UFO Insight article here, which I'm I'm looking at. I wish I had a chance to read it before the show, but I didn't. Um, let, let's look at ca cases, if you are aware of any, of multiple transplant, multiple recipient, multiple transplants, I should say. Um, we run into people, of course, who received, uh, you know, organs have failed and they received several organs from several different donors. Um, mm. have, has anyone really looked at that? And if so, are there combinations of personalities that can result uh, when the recipients come out of it? Yeah, I mean, I said there's probably two examples I can give you on this one. And I, I briefly mentioned the first one uh, earlier about the, the lady who, who had two kidney transplants, and the first kidney, you know, resulted in her, in, her, in her having quite a short temper. And what was interesting about this is when she, when that kidney failed, unfortunately for her, but she did get another kidney, and when that went ahead, that nasty personality, if you like, went away, and a new personality. Uh, took over, which was much more in sympathy with the original frame of mind. What I found interesting there was this kidney, which is essentially a small part of her body, um, almost became dominant as far as her personality went. Hmm. When that kidney went, her personality changed back to normal or, you know, slightly different, but not like, you know. So, so that was interesting to me that that one small change almost took over her entire personality. Now, there could be reasons for that. Maybe that change is so significant to the body that it just submits. Possibly the person who gave that kidney was a particularly nasty, domineering person. And maybe that, you know, I mean, I'm just speculating off the top of my mind here. Uh, so there could be any any number of uh, reasons for that. But uh, that that's one case where one person has certainly had two 
transplants of the same organ, granted, but they've resulted in two different personalities. There is another case where it's more like a three-way transplant. Now, what we've got here is, I forget the names, but we'll just say, I think it was Tim, uh, he was dying of bad lungs, basically. Now, he got a organ, he got new lungs and a new heart from uh, a lady who had just died. And because his heart was basically okay, his heart then went to another person who required a heart. Now, the person who got his heart suddenly became really quite aggressive, which was in sympathy with Tim's behaviour. Uh, he also started calling his wife, who was, I think it was Karen, Sandy, which was Tim's wife's name. Um, in On the other side of that, the guy who originally got the lungs and the heart, he became very morose and he passed away a few years after that. No, uh, There's no detail on, on what the cause of death was. But interestingly, his donor was a young woman who had committed suicide due to lost love, is, is, what, the, uh, is what the research papers say. And so it seems like instead of the aggressive behaviour that he had before, uh, he then became really quite depressed and very morose. And you've got to think that that's kind of come from, from the donor. So that's like a three-way thing there where everybody's personality is almost kind of swapped around. Um, and again, I, I just find it is interesting because there's no like rule of thumb as to what actually... Um, uh, but what just talking then, it does kind of suggest that this change, if it does happen, is so significant and traumatic that it almost takes over your original personality. Hmm. You uh, anticipated my next question, which was about suicides. Right, okay. Uh, now, they tend to be people who uh, obviously are very depressed, uh, have uh, mood swings, things of this kind. Um, I, I, I suppose there's no way to know how many, uh, what percentage of recipients receive organs from suicides. Um, d do you have any insight in on, on those personality changes and whether any of them are positive? In recipients, um, of... I mean, the only one I know about, the only one I know about is, uh, who we know for sure had committed suicide is an example that I, I gave there. It's an interesting uh, theory, though, or an interesting uh, notion because, you know, there's there's a lot of thoughts, for example, to say murder victims shouldn't be, uh, you know, we, we should think twice. Let me rephrase that. We should maybe think twice about using the organs of murder victims just because of the. Um, you know, the circumstances in which they've died. And, and the same could be put to people who have committed suicide. Now, you see, now we're kind of getting into mysticism almost because what you'll have here is you'll have people of a, of a medical nature will say, well, you know, that's crap, basically. And, you know, there's no medical reason why we can't, you know, move these organs across. It's not going to affect the person who receives them. We're going to do good with it. And that, 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 that's a sound logic. But given what we know and given all the people that have come forward to say, look, you know, I've experienced this and I've experienced that, if there's any truth to that, and then we're transferring these organs into people that, you know, are then going to experience similar feelings, then I think, I'm not, I think it's something we need to be aware of at the very least. I'm not saying we should be pulling organ donation or anything of that nature, mm. because it obviously does more good than harm. But um, we need to be aware of it. People are coming and saying this, and so if, you know... Yeah, it, I, I've not heard of any of the cases, but I do know there's a lot of concern about where those organs come from. Okay. Uh, a few times in days of yore, I ran into uh, dissociative identity disorder where multiple personalities, uh, none involving transplant recipients. Uh, however, <clears throat> one does um, uh, hear different voices, uh, rather dramatic uh, physical manifestations of other personalities, um, and th which leads into the question, how far do the cases we're discussing, uh, organ recipients, uh, how far does it go as far as the challenges in, in, in personality are concerned? Do does it ever go into uh, the realm of a different voice or uh, even sometimes even a different look? Um, how, f how much is, uh, what what's the story on that? I suppose it depends on who's doing the study. I mean, you know, there'll be a lot of people that would suggest that, yeah, this is very much in the recipient's head, you know, and um, it, that, that that would very much be the case. I would say that's really quite dismissive. Now, that's not to say that some of these cases aren't that. I mean, it very much could be the case. Um, I would say what that really does to us, though, is, is we just really don't understand how the mind works. We don't understand how DNA works, really. You know, there's 90% of DNA, which we call junk DNA. Mm. We, we've no idea what it does, what it's for, if it's active or anything of that nature. And the same is to do with the mind. Although, you know, we have an idea, a lot of it is just educated guesses. Uh, and so 
yeah, I think it's something that we need to ask. Uh, we need to we need to certainly consider it, but not in the sense of trying to put a wrap on something and then put that to bed. I think it should be asked in 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 more of a way of how can we understand the, the inner the workings of the inner mind and and. Well, again, what the mind and in turn consciousness actually is. Now, again, I know that's ambiguous, but uh, it's um, to me these are the things that need to be asked. These are things that need to be done before we can start to uh, to really begin to get an understanding of, of, of things of this nature. Okay, who exactly is studying the what we've been calling cellular memory, this phenomenon, and how <clears throat> seriously is it being taken in mainstream science? This does tend to be rather dismissive. Yeah, I would say it's probably not being taken uh, that serious. You've got, uh, you know, as I say, there's a lot of people that will, that will just say, look, I've debunked this. This is, uh, you know, it, it's just in one's mind, as we've just been speaking about. Uh, it basically down to the trauma of, of major surgery. And, and again, that's a sound argument to make. You know, going through such, uh, you know, taking out one of your organs, and put, that is going to be a very traumatic experience, there's no doubt about that. Um, whether that would explain... These sort of we're not just talking about personality twists that have changed somebody's personality. We're talking about personalities that match that of the donor. You can't just dismiss that as coincidence, you know. Uh, and so, in answer to that question, no, it's probably not being studied very seriously by mainstream science. The people that are studying it tend to be. I would guess the same people that, such as John Mack, for example, who studied alien abduction, mavericks and rebels, if you like, of the mainstream that just decide, look, you know, there's something here and I'm going to look at that and I'm going to put my professional uh, reputation on the line to do so. Uh, and, I, and I think once we get somebody of that nature, whoever that may be, studying this uh, and, uh, you know, whatever they may find, but when we get, when that happens, it, the mainstream will be forced to take it seriously. But, um, at the minute, it's something that's just too easy to dismiss. Um, but that's not to say that there's not something there to, to investigate, because there quite obviously is. Okay. One of the things we find, and I, I don't want to get you know paranoid here or anything, but uh, one, one does wonder at times about conspiracy theories, which is something that you deal with as well. Yeah. Every time we investigate what we refer to as flap areas of various sorts of phenomena that traditionally are unrelated, but we believe that are related because of the, mm. the processes involved, uh, we run into the government or something that seems like the government, you know, uh, whether it could be private industry, we don't know. Um, are you aware of any experiments on the, um, and of course they'd be classified, I'm sure, on the uh, commercial or governmental level? in uh, perhaps learning how to uh, manipulate people's personalities by minor organ transplants or, or, or physical surgery of some kind? I mean, is there any uh, anything in the wind out there about that? That's a good question. Um, that is a very good question. Um, the, what I know about mind control or influencing people's personalities is kind of done through, if you like, mind control, you know, um, some of your MKUltra programs and so on and so on, like, like low frequency programming, and, and you know, we've extensively on that. The one area where I say there could be a connection to organ donation or organ transplants and so on is um, obviously you've got your organ harvesting conspiracies, which are grim, and, you know, we're not necessarily getting to them there, but obviously yeah. that is an obvious one that you would want to look at if we're looking at experimentation with, with organs and, and how they how they affect people. The other one, uh, and this kind of ties into the UFO phenomenon, obviously I'm assuming you guys have heard of, uh, you know, obviously cattle mutilation and, and, and those oh, things. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, there's been cases of what, what's been termed or dubbed human cattle mutilation, where, you know, there was a guy in Brazil, and I think it was 1988, he was found in, in a reservoir with extremely similar... Uh, wounds, if you like, precise cuts to the face. Uh, yeah, I remember that. Move, so you know what I'm referring to. Yes. And the thing is, there's been alleged cases of, of this in Britain, in America, and Canada. Now, if that's the case, and these are real, and these are genuinely experiments of, 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 of such a nature, then I would say that would prob probably be a road you would want to go down, because you know, um, as I say, that's the only one I would say there is a connection to, or possible connection to uh, using organ transplantation to uh, manipulate somebody's personality. It's an interesting question. Um, again, it's outlandish to most people, but we know that kind of thing does happen. So, Okay, well, there we are. And I was going to get into maybe a little bit about uh, animal organs, but I mean, that there's probably uh, less study been done on that than there have been on 
uh, now this aspect of human uh, organ I, transplant. I would imagine so. I mean, yeah. uh, obviously you've got your cattle mutilations that have been studied uh, by, by numerous ufologists, but again, it, it's something that we don't really know what that is and whether that in itself has some kind of connection to to uh, potential organ uh, transplants that would result in, in some kind of uh, control. Um, it's a great point to bring up. It is. Well, we're, yeah, we're getting into vivisection and, and the island of Dr. Moreau or something in this case. <laughs> but, uh, we, we had run into uh, fish mutilations one time with Linda Moulton Howe. Oh, yeah. I remember that, that was, but uh, whether anyone's interested in changing the personalities of fish is somewhat doubtful. Well, anyway, <laughs> uh, Marcus, uh, thank you so very much for an interesting show. We'll be in touch off the air and very, very good sure. luck with your work. And, thank uh, you. It's been keep, keep it up. We hope to have you back uh, soon. Thank you very much. But I appreciate the time. It's been great speaking to you. Thank you very so much. Thank you. Okay, okay. everyone. Marcus Loth, uh, once our website is back out, check him out. We'll have uh, links to uh, his uh, sites there. and he's, uh, It's just fascinating stuff. Indeed. <clears throat> yeah.